So uh, in this lecture and the next lecture, uh, we are going to talk about environmental economics, so shifting gears quite a bit from the previous topics that we talked about. And then in the following two lectures, we're going to talk about tax policy, so switching the order a little bit because it seemed to work better uh, with the flow of the class. So uh, environmental economics, start with a picture that you've all heard about in the media, have all been thinking about. So climate change, you know, described in various ways. Here, just showing simple trends in global temperature and carbon dioxide concentration. So the line shows you CO2 concentration, and then uh, the bars show you average global temperatures, uh, and the mean over this period from 1880 to roughly to the present uh, is 57 degrees Fahrenheit. The blue bars show years when you're below that mean. The red bars show years when you're above the mean. And as you all know, uh, the Earth is getting warmer. And we also are seeing a tremendous increase in carbon dioxide carb and carbon emissions. And scientists think, and I think there's good evidence, that those two things are linked to each other because of um, carbon emissions, we have global warming, right? And so that, of course, is an issue of great concern in the US and abroad. And lots of people are trying to think about how you deal with this broad trend. Now, in, in the chart that I just showed you, you're just looking at average temperatures, but I think the term global warming that was traditionally used is sort of a misnomer because the key issue here is not that the average temperature is rising from 57 to 58 degrees, that one degree change, which I think strikes many people as that seems small, is that really a big deal? But it is a big deal because it, in particular, creates many more extreme weather events so if you now look not at average temperatures, but you look at the frequency and intensity of winter storms as one example of many different climactic events that are uh, becoming more frequent. So this is showing you, focus on the chart in the upper left first. By decade, uh, how frequent are winter storms? And again, same kind of bar chart. Uh, below the average back in 1950, 1960, 1970, and then you can see significantly higher frequencies after that point. You not only have higher frequencies, you also have much more intense storms now than you did in the past. So the way I think about it, like roughly speaking, not be, being a climate scientist, uh, it's not just about an increase in mean temperatures, it's also about an increase in variance of uh, climate, and that variance really matters because extreme Climate conditions create big costs uh, for, for humans, of course. And so you see that you know, in all countries, high latitudes on the top, countries closer uh, to the equator throughout the globe, you have more extreme climactic events. So lots of people are talking about these issues, talking about climate change, of course. Economists are one small part of that discussion. Uh, I think sort of the idealistic response that people who care about the climate um, you know, would have when seeing these sorts of data, uh, you know, being confronted by the dramatic change in climate. Many people have the view that, of course, we should try to preserve the environment in sort of its original state, no matter what the cost is. Like, it, that should be our goal, to try to just prevent all climate change. Um, and I can understand, you know, where that uh, appeal comes from at some level. That's sort of the, it seems like a principle that one might hold dear. Uh, economists, I think, come at it, as in much of the field, from sort of a more practical standpoint, thinking about the trade-offs between that view and other considerations, which are like you could have higher productivity and higher incomes, potentially, if you allow plants to emit more carbon dioxide. And so weigh the costs and benefits. As in much of the field of economics, rarely do we start from a principle that we absolutely want to uh, achieve a certain objective. It's more about weighing the costs and benefits about various things you might care about. And again, it's not to say that the idealistic view is wrong in some way. It's just that is the approach that economists take, and that's what we're going to talk about in the, in the next two lectures. So in order to understand the trade-off between the economic benefits of doing things like emitting more carbon and the environmental costs, uh, you need to price the environmental damage 
created by any given policy. So if you're going to loosen restrictions on what plants are allowed to do or the tr types of technology that people are al allowed to use in cars, there's going to be a benefit, perhaps, in terms of making cars cheaper or better in some way. And then there's going to be some cost to the environment. And you need to be able to price the environmental damage to be able to speak in, in scientific rigorous terms about whether you want to move in a particular direction or not. So that's one key feature of the economic approach. The second key feature of the economic approach, which we will talk about at length as well, is that we don't take human behavior as fixed. We recognize that humans adapt to changes in conditions, to changes in policies, but also to changes in climate. So for instance, the simplest example of that, when it gets really hot, humans have developed technologies to try to deal with that, namely air conditioning. Now, air conditioning itself has its own problems. Emissions created by air conditioning could worsen the problem of environmental damages, so it's not necessarily sort of a panacea. But the, the point I'm trying to make, and we'll try to illustrate how we, how we quantify this, is that you shouldn't just think of climate change like the initial trends that I showed you as that happens, we can't change anything, and there's going to be some cost. No, there's going to be some adaptation in equilibrium as the climate changes. For instance, people might not live near the coasts that are getting flooded, or they might build different sorts of barriers, uh, as is being done in the Netherlands, for example. There are lots of ways that human beings try, try to adapt. And so we need to take those behavioral responses into account to really understand the costs of climate change. OK, so to, just to keep a, give you a concrete example to fix ideas a little bit, suppose you're thinking about building a new oil pipeline or permitting fracking for natural gas, so two things that have been considered in the, in the recent years uh, by US government. So you know, some of the debate, I think, in this sort of space is just based on what people view as first principles, like we sh just should not be tapping into some of these environmental resources. In contrast, the type of approach we're going to talk about is you know, that's clearly going to have some benefits. It's going to reduce the cost of energy in the US, which is a critical input to so many things. And that's going to create lots of benefits in terms of increased welfare for, for Americans, effectively by increasing people's disposable incomes. But then on the flip side, we also recognize that permitting more of that sort of natural resource extraction is also going to create some environmental damage. And so let's just try to price that out from a practical point of view and see if the costs seem greater than the benefits. Okay, that, that's the type of problem we're going to talk about. OK, so getting into the economic substance of this a little bit, so the discussion of environmental economics is going to feel a little different than all of the previous topics we've talked about. And from a conceptual perspective, that's because environmental economics is fundamentally about externalities. So any of you who've taken other economics classes, you've come across the concept of externalities. Very simple idea. It's capturing a case where one person's behavior, like what I do, directly affects another person's well-being or another person's utility, to use the term economists would use. So uh, for instance, like what's a concrete example of that? If you drive a car that emits pollution, that doesn't per se have a big cost for you yourself. The bigger cost we're concerned about is that it affects everyone else in society. And if you're just trying to maximize your own well-being, you may drive a car that emits a lot of pollution, but we don't want to let you do that because you're harming lots of other people in the process. Another simple example of an externality, you know, if you're playing loud music in your dorm room, you may or may not want to do that yourself, and you may not internalize the fact that it's affecting uh, your roommates or, or other people who are around you. That's another example of something that is an externality where your behavior directly affects somebody else's well-being. So that's fundamentally different, if you think about it, from the outcomes that we've talked about so far in this class, which have mostly been things like your earnings, level of education, health. If you think about all of those things, you mostly care about those things from your own personal perspective rather than the way in which they're affecting society more broadly. That's not to say that there's no impact at all. So you know, if you have better health, it could actually benefit other people by reducing costs, for example, of healthcare provision, or if you're more educated, 
that might affect the way you know, other people benefit in terms of uh, contributions you make to society and so forth. But for the most part, we think most people care about those things from their own point of view, uh, not from a, the first order things are not these broader externalities, the, these broader social issues. And so because of that, uh, because these externalities are really critical, what results from that is you end up wanting to change people's behavior um, relative to what they might do by themselves. Okay? So essentially, tackling externalities, as you will see, requires both different types of data to measure these costs. So that's going to lead us to a different set of methods to, to, relative to what we've been talking about in previous lectures. Um, and it's going to require different types of policy approaches. So in particular, we're going to need to measure the impacts of certain policies or certain behaviors on everyone, not just on a given person's income or health. So you think about a lot of the studies we've been talking about. It's like, what's the impact of having a better teacher on your own income? What's the impact of uh, being in a different neighborhood on your own income? Here, it's going to be more focused on uh, what's the impact of a given policy change or, you know, carbon uh, permits or something like that on society as a whole, not on, one, any, not on what any one person is getting from that. So that's one methodological difference, and you'll see how that leads us to use different data and methods. The second, as I was just saying, is that with externalities, because you're concerned about how one person's behavior affects other people, the goal is often to change people's behavior, to move away from what is in their best interest. So often with the other work, we're trying to help people achieve their maximum potential themselves. Here we're trying to say, you know, it might be best for you if you drive that inexpensive car that emits a lot of pollution, but we actually don't want you to do that because it's gonna hurt other people. Uh, and so that's gonna lead us to kind of steer you away from the behavior you would have chosen yourself in your own interest. So contrast that, for example, with some of the discussion we had about college outreach programs to get more qualified low-income kids to apply to elite colleges, for example. The reason we want to do those outreach programs is mainly to help those own kids achieve better outcomes themselves, uh, whereas here we're interested in changing people's behavior to achieve social aims rather than individual benefits. Okay. So to think about that uh, in a more precise way, what do we mean by changing behavior and what kinds of things do we need to measure in order to change behavior in the right way to maximize social welfare? Let me just walk you through a simple diagram, a simple sort of demand model that economists would use to think about this problem. It's the simplest way to think about externalities. Any of you who've taken Act 10 or other introductory economics classes will have seen this already. So let's imagine a market where you're thinking about demand for gasoline. Uh, and so on the horizontal axis here, this is just hypothetical, you've got the number of gallons of gasoline that are demanded. Uh, and then on the vertical axis is the price. So we're just plotting a demand curve here, which is just saying as we lower the price of gasoline, people want to buy more and more gasoline, right? So at a very high price, on the left side, demand for gasoline is much lower than on the very right. So now imagine that the cost of producing gas for oil companies, let's say, is $3 a gallon. Okay, so given a cost of $3 a gallon, the amount of gasoline that consumers are going to demand in equilibrium, you can just read that off the demand curve, is going to be 150 billion barrels of gasoline, let's say, in this example. All right? And so uh, what's going on here is the firms we're assuming are pricing uh, gasoline at the marginal cost of production, which is what would happen in a competitive market. But all you need to know here is just imagine consumers face a cost of $3 per gallon. They're going to end up consuming 150 billion gallons of gasoline. So in a world where there are no externalities and people are just optimizing and choosing what's best for them, this is what the equilibrium would be, and we would just let things be, and people would consume 150 billion barrels, and, and that'd be fine. 150 billion gallons, et cetera. Now, uh, what we're, the, the issue we're focused on here is, in practice, the actual social cost of consuming a gallon of gasoline is higher 
than the cost of producing that one gallon of gas. And so in this example, I'm going to assume that the social cost of consuming another gallon of gas because of the pollution that it emits when you drive your car is a dollar more. I'm just going to make up that number. It's a dollar more than the cost of production. So the actual social cost of consuming gas is $4 a barrel, oh, sorry, $4 a gallon, rather than $3 a gallon. And so what that means is that in equilibrium, in just a free market, people are going to be consuming more gas than would be socially optimal, than would maximize social welfare. And so that's illustrated by this yellow triangle here. Let me just walk you through the intuition of that. So when you're consuming 150, million, 150 billion gallons, the marginal, the, the value to the consumer, the person who's buying that last 150th gallon, that person values that at $3 a gallon, right? They're just willing to pay $3 in order to buy that last gallon of gas. But the social cost of producing that last gallon of gas is actually $4. So society is actually losing a dollar when you consume that last gallon of gas because you're only getting $3 of benefit and the cost of producing that gallon of gas when we take the environmental damage into account is a dollar higher. Now, if you look at that yellow triangle, you can see in that entire region, people are consuming more than they ideally would in the, in the sense that they value the gas that they are consuming, as shown by the demand curve, at less than the, the, cost of, the social cost of production. And so that yellow triangle is what we call the deadweight loss of excess gasoline consumption, that people are consuming too much gas relative to the social optimum, which would be which would be given by 100 billion gallons of gasoline in this example, where the demand curve intersects $4, right? At that point, the, the marginal consumer, the last consumer who's buying that 100th gallon, uh, is willing to pay $4 for it, and that's exactly the social cost of producing that last gallon of gas, and so that's the amount of gas we should be consuming, okay? So the basic problem here illustrates the, the basic issue with externalities in general, where when your own behavior has some effect on other people that you don't internalize when you act in your own best interest, you may end up doing too much of that. In this case, you consume too much gas relative to what would be socially optimal. And you can see this creates a potential role for the government to try to get people to consume less gas. And we're going to talk about various ways in which you might do that. You could do that by imposing a tax on gas. You could do that by imposing a tax on firms that produce gas. You could do it through regulations. There are many different ways in which you could try to achieve this goal of getting people to consume less of a good that emits pollution. Okay, so this so is just a very simple way to depict what I think is the fundamental economic issue in thinking about uh, environmental damage. Okay, so any questions on this basic logic here? Okay, so one way to think about what we're going to do in the rest of these lectures is in the simple diagram, I basically made up these numbers, and we're going to think about how we can use modern data to quantify some of the key parameters here to actually measure what the environmental damage is of pollution, and then think systematically about what types of policies, for example, how large of a tax rate on gas would you need in order to mitigate the climate change that's resulting from carbon emissions, for instance. Okay, so concretely, uh, the first question we're going to focus on is how can we measure the social cost of pollution? So in this example, that's what is the difference between the red line and the green line? I made up $1 here. How can we estimate what that actually is in the data? And then second, what policies can we use to reduce pollution and improve the environment? How can we, in this example, get from 150 down to 100? Okay, those are the two sets of questions I'll focus on. So let's start with the first one, the social costs of climate change and pollution. Okay, so researchers have estimated the social costs of many different types of pollution, from uh, toxic air pollution to water pollution, 
The, the type of pollution that has received the most attention, perhaps because of its great importance, uh, is carbon emissions. So given the link between car carbon emissions and climate change, uh, lots of people have studied exactly how costly uh, additional carbon emissions are and how we might regulate that going forward. And in particular, that's been distilled into something uh, people call estimates of the social cost of carbon uh, that governments now use systematically when evaluating alternative policies. So if you have one more ton of carbon dioxide emitted because of whatever happens in the economy, industrial production or anything else that people are doing, what cost is that gonna impose in terms of the climate? And people have tried to work hard to quantify what that cost is in dollar terms. So the, the conceptual question that people are seeking to answer in that literature is how much does an additional unit of carbon emissions cost society uh, due to environmental change? And I'm gonna walk you through how people have tried to figure that out. To be clear, it's not like this question has been completely resolved and we just know what the answer is. It's the subject of ongoing research, but you will see how quite a bit of progress has been made. So at a high level, there are three broad steps that people take in estimating the social cost of carbon. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what the impact of one extra ton of carbon uh, dioxide emissions on the climate will be using some climate forecasting model. So I showed you, for example, at the beginning, as carbon emissions were rising, you have higher temperatures, you have more extreme climactic events. So you need some way to basically understand the link between increasing carbon emissions and changes in the climate. Now this itself, this is a purely, I think of it as like a natural science question, like how does the atmosphere work? Um, that itself, as you probably know from reading the news, is a controversial question, right? So the people debate to some extent the extent to which climate change is being caused by humans and being caused by carbon dioxide emissions. But I'm just gonna take that as a given. So there's a large body of research by scientists working on these issues that tries to show in various ways that there's a causal link between more carbon emissions and changes in the climate. And people have developed these big climate forecasting models that show as you have extra carbon emissions, this is what's gonna happen to temperatures, this is what's gonna happen to extreme weather events, and so forth. Okay, so that's step number one. Step number two is, okay, now I have some sense of how the climate might change when I have more carbon emissions. Now, how is that then gonna affect the various things that enter people's utility functions that affect human welfare? So things like economic productivity, people's health, property damage that might occur from storms, the various things that matter in terms of uh, affecting human welfare. And then third, that sequence of damages, the costs that, that we calculate, first from climate change and then its downstream impacts on human welfare, that's gonna accrue over a series of years going into the future. So some of that is gonna happen next year, some of that's gonna happen 10 years from now, some of that's gonna happen 100 years from now when things might be much worse than they are at present if we don't, for instance, control carbon emissions uh, around the world. And so you've got this stream of future costs and you've gotta figure out some way to add up those costs and convert them into what economists would call a present value, how much is the stream of damages going out you know, for infinite future years worth today? Now you might think, you know, the simple way to think about it is what if you just add it up, just straight add everything up? The problem with that is if you just take an undiscounted sum, it's gonna be infinity, right? Because if you've got damages in every year going forward and you've got an infinite horizon, it's just gonna add up to an arbitrarily large number depending upon what the horizon is. So the way people usually think about it is money money you get later is worth less than money at present. We tend to discount the future relative to the present. And so there's a question of how you discount those future costs to current dollars, which is a third area of research and is a third critical ingredient in these calculations. So as I was saying, the first question is basically, the way I see it is it's in the domain of environmental science. It's outside the domain of social science. It involves principles of physics and understanding climatology and so forth. So I'm not gonna talk, talk about that here. I'm just gonna take as off the shelf, people have figured out in some way how carbon emissions affect the climate. Where economics enters and where social science enters is in steps two and three. 
trying to understand how the climate affects human behavior, affects outcomes, how we should think about pricing these things in the present versus the future, and so forth. So we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about work on steps two and three. Any questions on the overall kind of plan here? OK, great. So there are a number of recent studies that estimate the causal impacts of climate change on a variety of different outcomes. And basically, what they do is combine data on outcomes from many different sources. You'll see that in a second. Uh, with detailed measurements of temperature from local monitors. So there are these weather stations around the US where you can get very high frequency measures. You see this all the time. Like if you go to uh, look at the weather on your phone, being aggregated from local monitors. And so we have good data on temperature and other climactic conditions at a local level. And then we have lots of data, as you know from uh, earlier lectures in this class, on a variety of different outcomes, income, other things. So general approach here is to estimate models that relate outcomes to fluctuations in temperature across days or across years. Okay, so the, the key here is that we're going to do comparisons across time within areas rather than comparisons across areas. So the simple thing you might think about doing is you know, if I want to understand the effects of hotter temperatures or more extreme weather events on outcomes, you might say, let's just compare the parts of the world that are hotter with the parts of the world that are cooler, or let's compare parts of the world that are experiencing more storms with parts of the world that are experiencing less storms. So that makes sense intuitively, but there's an obvious problem with that, which is that um, any such cross-sectional comparison is going to be confounded by many other factors that vary across places, right? So warmer countries, for various other institutional reasons, have lower levels of GDP. So for instance, if you think about, you know, you're effectively comparing uh, productivity and output, say, in African countries versus European countries, and that sort of comparison, you're going to get something where you find big differences, but it might not just be because of the weather. It might be because of various other things that are different between those places. So the hope is that by using variation in the temperature across areas, sorry, within areas, um, especially at a high frequency, that variation is effectively random from the perspective of human beings. So it happens to be colder today and it was warmer a couple days ago. We think that's essentially random and uncorrelated with other factors. And so if we look at a high frequency at how outcomes are changing, maybe we get at the direct causal effects of the climate. So I think that's a pretty compelling way to identify causal effects because we think that the process that's generating the climate at that level of frequency is basically exogenous. It's unrelated to what humans are doing for other reasons. So that's an advantage of that approach. The disadvantage of that approach, which you're probably thinking about, is that it picks up very short-run effects, right? So if the way that I'm going to learn about climate change uh, and global warming is by comparing what was going on two days ago when it was warmer, what's going on today when it's colder, you know, if you make that too close across days, as you can think about intuitively, you're not going to pick up some of the effects that may take a long time to emerge. So there could be long lags in terms of the impacts that these things have. And in particular, one of the ways in which you can get those lags is through adaptation. So if I've got a temperature that's like bouncing up and down, like take an example of air conditioning. So if once in a while I have a very hot day, uh, I might not bother to install air conditioning in my house. And so when it gets really hot, I might be really unhappy and it gets really unpleasant and I see negative outcomes. But if it's hot forever, then people might change the way they build their houses and buy air conditioners in particular. And so the costs of um, higher heat in the long run might be lower if, if people are able to adapt and change technology. And you're not going to pick that up with these short run methods. So I'm going to come back to talk about the adaptation issue after first showing you a set of results just based on this short run variation. And that uh, what I'm going to talk about in particular is a study by Carlton and Shang where they compile results of several studies that people have done of a variety of different outcomes relating these high frequency temperature changes within areas to a variety of different things. So let's start with simple economic measure. GDP, gross domestic product per capita. So basically, think of it as like average incomes per capita. 
at what rate are they growing? So what's the growth rate of incomes? And so they are looking at that uh, within countries relative to deviations from average temperatures. All of the next few slides I'm gonna show you have that feature. So basically to, to describe the mechanics of this, the way people construct this is they ask, what is the average temperature in a given country? Let's say it's 20 degrees Celsius. And what is the temperature in a given year? So suppose the average temperature in a given year is 22 degrees. I'm gonna call that plus two. If it's 18 degrees, I'm gonna call it minus two. And then in some other country, the average temperature might have been 25 degrees. And if it's 27, I'm gonna call it plus two. And if it's 23, I'm gonna call it minus two for that country. So I'm basically gonna norm it to your overall average. And then to make the scale easy to interpret, they're just gonna add back on the x-axis the global average temperature. So for, for those of you who've taken econometrics class, another way to say this is they're putting in country fixed effects um, and they're looking at how GDP changes around country means when you have higher versus lower uh, temperatures relative to your average, okay? And so what you can see here is I think an intuitive pattern and one that you find for a lot of outcomes which is that you have lower growth rates when you have extreme temperatures that deviate from something like 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. So if it's super hot or very cold, you tend to have less economic growth in that year. Okay, so that's one uh, simple finding. So another version of this, so look at this now um, within the United States and look at total income per capita. Uh, same kind of analysis as before from a different study, and you see a very similar pattern where here on the low end, there's not that much of a decline if it gets particularly cold in a, uh, in a given uh, day, but then, sorry, in a given year, but then if you look on the right and it gets extremely hot, you see a very sharp decline in uh, total incomes uh, per capita relative to other years. Okay, so again, this phenomenon of there being sort of a sweet spot and optimal temperature. So now to understand why that happens, why are we seeing that total economic output is related to temperatures, you can dig into the underlying production function a little bit, try to understand the mechanics of what's going on. So one simple thing you might think of is in the context of agriculture, you can understand for, you know, very easily why temperature matters. So if you look at, in this case, maize yields, you see that if it gets extremely hot, you basically lose your crop, your productivity, productivity of agriculture falls, and in particular, maize yields fall very sharply if it gets too hot. And so that's kind of a direct technological explanation for why you see the link between temperature and GDP. But as you know, Agriculture is now a small part of GDP in the US and most other developed countries. So it's hard to imagine that the link between temperature and GDP overall is entirely driven by these straight technological effects in agriculture. So more generally, you see that there are links between temperature and lots of other forms of human productivity as well, not just agricultural yield. So this study is looking at math test scores uh, when students take tests relative to average temperatures. And you can see that on, um, in hot years, and this actually works at the daily level as well, if you happen to take your test on a very hot day, uh, you tend to score lower on your test than if you happen to take your test on a day that's more pleasant. Uh, and you know, the magnitudes here, they're not enormous, but they're not tiny either. So, you can see that on the hottest days, students are scoring something like four percentiles lower than if they're taking the test on a day with a optimal temperature. Uh, and so, you know, that shows you how these effects go beyond agriculture. Humans as well are affected by changes in, in climate and human productivity. So now going to some broader uh, sets of outcomes beyond these productivity measures. So another example of use of modern data so profanity in social media posts, you can see that when, when it gets really hot, people are much more likely to use profanity in social media posts, another way to kind of show that people are unhappy uh, when you have extreme weather events. Um, and then, you know, more seriously, if 
you look at crime, you look at rates of rape, you also see a sharp link with temperature anomalies, deviations from the norm in a given place. You see much higher rates of uh, rape in this case, in the study, uh, when you have very high temperatures relative to the mean. So those latter things show that you're affecting behavior beyond the economic domain, and then kind of the ultimate way in which that manifests itself is in the context of mortality. So if you look at rates of mortality from this study in Italy, you again get this U-shape, where if you've got temperatures near the middle, you have lower rates of mortality than if you have um, very low or very high temperatures. And that's been documented systematically in a number of studies. Extreme weather events lead to much worse health outcomes as well. Okay, so all of that shows that in the short run, when you look at these temperature fluctuations, there are significant costs to humans in a variety of different ways. Um, but the, the question then is, do those simple statistical models that we just talked about, do they provide good predictions of what the long-term impacts of climate change would be? Recognizing that in the long run, humans will be able to adapt by changing technology. So this is a quite hard question to get at because in order to analyze the impacts of long-term trends in climate, ideally what you would do is say, look at what was happening in 1950 versus at present in the US in some outcome where we've had climate change over that period as I showed you in the first slide and you've also had time to adapt and you might ask, okay, why, why don't we compare rates of mortality or rates of income, you know, 50 years later versus in that, that time period. But, you know, the problem with that is obvious, which is that over a 50 or 60 year period, lots of other things have changed as well. And so obviously it would be extremely misleading if I were to compare mortality rates today versus in the past and attribute that all to climate change. Uh, there are lots of other things that are going on. So instead, what people tend to do, and what I'll show you some evidence on, is look at, again, the effects of short-run changes, but do that in places that have had time to adapt versus places that have not had time to adapt. So for example, does a heat wave have smaller effects in an area that experiences heat waves regularly? So that would be a way of testing whether there's some adaptation that, that seems important. Another way to ask this question is, if you have temperature fluctuations, do they have smaller costs in more advanced economies where there's been more technological development? So to give you a sense of how that looks and why adaptation actually is quite important. So let's come back to this issue of temperature and mortality. So as we saw, when you have extremely high temperatures, you have higher rates of mortality. So what we're doing here is looking at the impact of a day that's above 90 degrees Fahrenheit on mortality rates. But we're going to do that separately, looking at areas that have different average long-run temperatures. So think of different regions or states within the United States that have different long-run temperatures. So on the left, these are places that are generally pretty cold. So think about places in the north, like Wisconsin or Minnesota, something like that. And then on the far right, think about places like Florida or Texas, which are typically pretty hot, okay? So what you can see here is when you have an unusually hot day, you have that unusual 90 degree day in a place that's pretty cold, you have a big spike in mortality rates. But if you have a 90 degree day in Texas, where you're used to having 90 degree days you know, every summer from time to time, it actually doesn't have any effect at all. So this is very consistent with the idea that people seem to adapt. You can't just use the short run fluctuations by themselves to estimate what's gonna happen in the long run as we have climate change. You know, in the long run, the impact in this example, it could even be you know, very small on mortality if people figure out ways to adapt perfectly and not be affected by the change in temperature. Another way to see that is to use historical data and see what the impact of technology has been. So this is, again, looking at the relationship between mortality and average temperatures, and you again get the sort of U shape where mortality rates are high when you have very hot days or cooler days. But that relationship was way steeper 
between 1929 and 1959, in particular when you have extremely hot days, than between 1960 and 2004. What's the simple reason for that? We now have air conditioning. We now have ways to control the climate effectively, at least internally, so that we aren't subject to these extremely hot uh, temperatures in ways that, that affect us. So another example of why adaptation uh, really does seem to matter. Third example, rather than looking over time periods, now let's look across countries. So this is, again, looking at the impacts of daily average temperature on mortality rates, but now comparing India to the United States. Uh, and you can see that in the US, there's a little bit of an uptick on the right um, in, uh, in hot years. Uh, whereas in India, there's a really high uptick on the right. And again, we think that's likely due to technological differences, that in the US, we're able to buffer these hot temperatures in a way in, in more advanced economies, in a way that's harder to do in developing countries. OK, and then a last example going outside the temperature uh, domain. Um, think about the effects of cyclones in this example from, from the study where they're looking at the mortality impact of cyclones. And with cyclones, the critical thing that matters to measure intensity of a cyclone is wind speed. And so as you have higher wind speed, you have more people who were killed in a, in a cyclone historically. You see that clearly in the data. But the slope of that relationship varies greatly across countries. And in particular, it is much flatter in countries that tend to have a lot of cyclones. So Japan, as you can see by the vertical line there, has higher and more intense cyclones, has more and more intense cyclones on average than the Philippines and then Vietnam. And you can see that in the countries that experience cyclones more frequently and have more intense cyclones more frequently, they tend to have a flatter gradient. When you have a very severe cyclone, it doesn't hurt as much. Why does, that, why does it work that way? Because the way you build things is going to be different if you have cyclones frequently, right? So another example of how adaptation really seems to matter. OK, so putting this all together, um, we have these various estimates of the impact of climate change of various types, as I've just been showing you, on, uh, on a variety of economic and health outcomes. And so there's a study by Burke et al which aggregates these various estimates and predicts that climate change, whatever climate change that will occur if we don't change anything about regulating carbon emissions, et cetera, by 2100, will lower global GDP by about 25%. So if we um, were to do nothing and just go on the path that we're going on, where the climate's going to change significantly, you're going to have a quarter less income globally than you would have otherwise had had there been no climate change. Now, that estimate is based on short-run fluctuations in temperature, so the types of studies that I was just showing you here. Uh, they argue that the long-term impacts are likely to be similar, despite the evidence of adaptation that I've been showing you in specific contexts. And they argue that, I don't know if it's you know, completely definitive, but the reasoning is that the relationship between temperature and GDP as a whole has not attenuated in recent years. So it seems just as strong now as it did in the past. The relationship between temperature and things like mortality has become more attenuated in recent years. It's smaller now than in the past that I was showing you, as I was showing you. But the relationship with GDP, maybe because it affects productivity in numerous ways, not just agriculture, but education and various other things, you know, that's remained fairly strong, and they argue it's likely to persist. So, you know, maybe that assumption's right, maybe it's not. We don't know for sure, but I think broadly it suggests that climate change can have and is likely to have quite substantial uh, costs going forward. Now, one further limitation, I've been emphasizing this adaptation angle, a further limitation of these types of measures, trying to make this prediction about 25% loss in global GDP, is that it's actually pretty hard to measure economic output systematically. So in the US, we're very familiar with the idea of GDP statistics released every year. We think that we can measure total economic output, the number of people who are working, 
what they're getting paid and things like that. We have national accounts to do that in a very systematic way. In many other countries, especially developing countries and especially in rural areas, you don't have those types of records. So you're really sort of guessing when you're trying to make a prediction on how changes in climate or any policy for that matter will affect total economic output. So a different approach that is popular, especially in this literature, but increasingly so in, e in other parts of economics, is to measure output using other creative methods. And I just want to give you an illustration of that, so kind of the cool new data that people are using. Um, and in particular, a measure that's starting to be used more and more is nighttime light intensity based on satellite images. So just to give you an example of how this works, one way you can measure productivity and output in a, in a place, this has been shown to be a pretty good predictor of GDP, is just how intense the lights look in a given area at night from a satellite image, right? It makes sense intuitively. If there's a lot of activity and income in a place, there will tend to be more lights on. And so as a predictive exercise, thinking back to the past couple of lectures on prediction, this is a pretty good predictor, it turns out, of economic output in places where you have data on economic output. And so to illustrate how you can use that data, going back to this Carlton Chang paper uh, that I was talking about earlier that compiles all of these different um, estimates of, of the impacts of, of climate change, they aggregate that to kind of illustrate uh, what the impacts of climate change would be so on the left is what they call a business as usual scenario, where we don't do anything to regulate carbon. We just continue on the path we're currently on. And they're showing with the intensity of colors um, how much hotter the globe is getting. So you can see it's much more red in the globe on the left. And then the white patches that you're seeing are the lights that you'd see in different places based on their estimates in, in different countries. And so you can see that in particular, in large parts of Africa and Asia, um, you see, uh, sorry, in South America and in Africa, you see significantly fewer lights there. Now, if you look at the globe on the, on the right, you see a different picture. So here, what they're thinking about is a scenario where you have stringent emissions reduction. So you have policies that really reduce the amount of uh, carbon emissions. And what you can see here is you have significantly more lights on, basically, in much of the world, right? Even in North America, you see that in much of the Southeast, for example, you'd have significantly fewer lights on, business as usual scenario. It would take a big hit in terms of productivity there relative to if we were able to, to uh, regulate emissions and similarly elsewhere in the world. So more generally, this is a way to try to measure output and in this particular case, visualize how things will change in terms of economic productivity around the world. Because let me stop here and take questions on this or any of the things that I've been talking about. Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. So let me try to restate the question, make sure I, I get it right. So um, I think what you're saying is, is it's sort of shifting the goalposts over time where you, know, you adapt so that you're able to deal with 90 degree days, but in the future we might have more 100 degree days or 110 degree days. And, have we adapted enough to actually be able to deal with that? So it's a good question. So the way I think about it is not so much that we have adapted now in a way that forever going forward, we will not have to worry about hot days because we now have AC and it's, you know, we're able to deal with whatever will happen. So I agree with you, like that may not be the case. What, but I think the, the broader lesson here is that whatever impacts you're seeing in the short run may not necessarily be fully predictive of what you will see in the much longer run, right? Because even if we can't deal with 100 degree days now very effectively, presumably 30 years from now, people will come up with more efficient air conditioners or some other technology that will allow us to deal with 100 degree days or 110 degree days. Now, that might break down at some point. Presumably, there's some limit to, at, at which you won't be able to, to adapt to that. But I think the general point here that people are very focused on, economists in particular, is that you shouldn't take the climate as something that just has some impact and humans never respond to it. And think about kind of the historical record, like, oh my goodness, like if it was really hot on a given day, we see all these terrible outcomes. No, we might actually be able to make some adjustments and humans are ingenious and we'll figure out ways to adapt going forward. And so that's the type of message that, that people are trying to get at. Even if the exact 
method of adaptation, I agree with you, may, will probably not work forever. Right? Others? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so mortality, I mean, I think a very crude way to price a life would be literally what it contributes to GDP. Uh, like, what is your income? So I think even economists would not do something that uh, kind of money-oriented. But uh, I think the more general way to look at it, and we're not, there's a literature on this, which I'm not going to talk about here, but it's called on estimating the value of a statistical life. So that's a big part of the sort of environmental economics externalities literature. And the basic idea is to try to estimate, you need to put exactly as you're saying, some value on lives, essentially, in order to be able to turn this into a dollar cost at the end of the day, right? And so people have, this might seem like a crazy thing to try to value, but people have tried to value how much we should price each life and have ended up at a number of something like five or six million dollars a year. There's some debate about this. Sorry, sorry, not per year, five or six million dollars per life. And so how do you end up with that estimate the way people think about it is in a probabilistic sense. So if you ask someone, uh, if I were to offer you a product that uh, provides you some insurance that reduces your risk of dying, say, in an accident by 10%, how much are you willing to pay for that? And so the idea is if I give you an answer of X for that, under certain assumptions, I can assume, I, I can basically infer that you value your life at 10 times X, because that's what you're willing to pay. Now, there are various issues there in whether that translation actually tries to work, but that's the type of approach. You know, the core point which you're raising is exactly right. In order to do these calculations, you need to attach some dollar value to lives, as uncomfortable as that might be. And there are various methods that people try to develop to, to assess that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Th those are good questions. I mean, they get at philosophical questions of whether the current generation of people who are alive really have the right to be discounting the value of future lives, right? And so I'm going to talk about that second step and the way economists have tried to approach it um, and you know how we kind of do it from a measurement point of view, how we get a discount rate. But it's not honestly going to address the question you're raising, which I view as more of a moral issue, which gets to the point that the people who are currently alive sort of have a seat at the table in figuring out these policies, and people who are going to be alive in the future don't. And so the fact that we might say we discount the future relative to uh, the present, you know, obviously takes a particular perspective that's relevant to the people who are alive today, and from a broader perspective might be viewed as unfair. So I think that's a very hard issue to, to grapple with that probably goes outside what we're able to measure systematically, with, systematically in the data. What I'm going to talk about in a little bit uh, when we get to it is just if you've got the stream of dollar payments, how do people, if you're willing to take the assumption, take the view that we do have the right in the current generation to just price things, and it's the decisions of the current generation that matter for whatever reason, uh, how do we end up pricing that stream of flows? So I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a few slides. Yeah. Outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the left, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good question, good observation. 
So what is going on here? So you, you know, don't have a lot of data in certain, you know, extremes. So for instance, if, I mean, let me look at a couple of other of these. So, you know, as you, so you're observing that as you get out to the edges, the confidence interval is becoming wider. So why does that happen? It's precisely because those are extreme events, right? So the number of days you have, like you look at this particular chart, where the maximum temperature is zero degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Celsius is just fewer than the number of days you have where the maximum temperature is like 22 degrees Celsius. So it makes intuitive sense, right, that you have the wider confidence intervals on the, on the edges relative to the middle. You know, uh, the way I look at it is, yes, there's some uncertainty about exactly what the magnitude is on the right side of this chart, but there's no doubt that it's much higher than the magnitude at 20, right? Even if you took the bottom of the confidence interval. So I think it's a reality. It's probably fortunate that we don't have lots of these super extreme hot or cold days. That limits the amount of data we have, but I think we have enough data to say that you know, there, is a, there is a real impact here, even if we're not perfectly confident about the magnitudes. Um, OK, great. So let me um, press on here and uh, talk about, I've, I've spent a bunch of time talking about climate change and carbon emissions. I'm gonna get to the discounting issue, which is the next step in this process in a second. But before I do that, I wanna talk about a different set of externalities, a different uh, set of issues in uh, environmental economics and a different type of environmental damage that just illustrates some uh, different types of methods that are, that are useful here. Okay, so in particular, we're gonna talk about the impacts of air pollution next, uh, another thing that you, know, you care a lot about. And so in uh, particular, we're gonna talk about the study by Eisen et al, where they examine the impacts of air pollution on children's long-term economic outcomes. So this is gonna look a little bit more similar to some of the earlier studies we've talked about where we track people over long periods of time and look at how early conditions affect later outcomes, in this case, early environmental conditions. So they're gonna use administrative data from census and tax records, similar to a bunch of the other studies I've described in this class. Um, to examine how pollution in your birthplace affects your employment and earnings at age 30. Now, in order to do that, you need to have a source of variation in pollution that looks like a randomized experiment or looks like a quasi-experiment, okay? And so a very useful tool in this context that a number of researchers have uh, exploited is the Clean Air Act that was enacted in 1970 in the United States. So what the Clean Air Act did is that it placed a ceiling on total suspended particulates, so a measure of air pollution, that all counties in the US had to follow. So there was a max level of air pollution you could have, and you had a certain number of years to come into compliance. But if you were above that level, US law required that you had to bring air pollution down to that level. Now, some counties, it turned out, they were not that polluted to begin with. Maybe they didn't have that much industrial production, whatever. They were like already below the ceiling that the government imposed, so they didn't have to change anything. Other counties were not below that ceiling, so they had to make active efforts with their local industry to reduce air pollution and come below the newly imposed ceiling. So the reason I'm describing the feature of that law in, in some detail is that this type of setup is incredibly useful for research because it leads to differential changes in pollution across counties that effectively gives you a treatment group and a control group and sets up a natural quasi-experiment. So in particular, it sets up a difference in differences design, which I'm gonna describe in the next few slides, and that's a very widely used quasi-experimental method that's useful for lots of different questions. Okay, so to, to show you how that method works in the context of this example, first gonna start by just showing you what this policy change enacted 1971 is when it uh, went into uh, effect. Um, how that affected just levels of pollution, all right? So this chart, which is from a paper by economists Che and Greenstone in 2005, plots 
average daily readings of a measure of air pollution, total suspended particulates, um, in two groups of counties in the United States, what they call attainment counties, which are the lower curve here, the solid diamonds. So the attainment counties, that refers to counties that were already in compliance with the threshold that the government imposed, the ceiling that the government imposed. So in particular, the ceiling is shown by that horizontal solid line, so around 78. You had to have your level below 78 um, units by 1975, okay? And you can see that in the attainment counties, like think of rural counties, for example, they were already below that threshold, so they didn't have to do anything to meet the law. So then there's the non-attainment counties, the upper series, shown by the open squares. Those guys were above the ceiling that the federal government imposed, and they had to come into compliance with the law. So how do you do that? Like if you've got a coal plant in your area, you've got to change, you've got to install scrubbers, you've got to change the technology, et cetera. So you can see that they in fact complied with the law. Total pollution in those places falls steeply over the next few years, such that by 1975, they are below the threshold as well. So why is this useful? It's because it sets up, as I was just saying, uh, a difference in differences quasi-experimental methodology where you exploit the differential changes in pollution across counties uh, to implement uh, a treatment control sort of quasi-experimental design. So what's the idea of the diff and diff experiment? Basically, you compare an area that experienced a change. So like in a randomized experiment, you would think of that as the treatment group with an area that did not experience a change. Think of that as the control group. Okay, so it's not truly randomized, but um, by comparing the differences in outcomes in the treatment areas versus the control areas before versus, an after, before versus after a policy change, you can potentially get a result that's almost as compelling as having a randomized experiment. So let me show you on this example how that would work. So same chart as before, I'm just labeling the four sort of regions that we would use in a, in a difference and difference estimate. So the control group is uh, the attainment counties. These are the counties that didn't have to change anything as a result of this law. They're sort of the control. They, there was no change in policy for them effectively. And so we've got the control group before the policy change prior to 1971 the control group after the policy change, that's after 1971. So those are two sets of data that we can look at. Then we've got the treatment group, which is the uh, people who weren't in compliance to begin with, the counties that weren't in compliance. They were treated in the sense that they had to change um, pollution in their areas. And again, we can split that up into treatment before the policy change versus treatment after the policy change. So the difference and difference estimate, I'm first gonna define how we estimate it, and then I'm gonna talk about the identification assumption under which this is a valid estimate of the causal effect of the policy. So the, the difference and difference estimate is defined as shown on the bottom of this slide. It's the average level of the outcome, in this case pollution, after, for the treatment group, TA, treatment after, minus treatment before, so that's the difference within the treatment group before versus after, minus the corresponding before versus after difference in the control group, okay? So why do we call it difference in differences? Because we're gonna take two different differences, the differences within the treatment area before versus after, and the differences in the control area before versus after, and then we're gonna take the difference of those differences and that's gonna be our estimate of the causal effect of the policy change. So why, do we, why is this a useful method? Why is this an estimator that, that people use in a lot of settings? So the difference in difference, it, the key thing it does, it avoids the biases that can arise from comparing different types of places or just analyzing differences over time in a single place. So to give you an example of that, just coming back to this chart, two different ways you might have thought about analyzing this question, aside from this particular methodology, you might have said, forget about the control group, 
I'm just going to look at the treatment group. That's where pollution actually changed. And I'm just going to look at the difference in outcomes after versus before the policy change. Or more generally, at the federal level, we changed some policy in the nation. Let's just look at average outcomes for kids after versus before. So what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that lots of other things might have changed between 1967 and 1975. Like maybe we had improvements in health technology or health care or changes in the economy. And so if you just look before versus after, what we'd call a pre-post comparison of a policy, it's not going to be very convincing that you've isolated the causal effect of that one policy. A different thing you might have thought about doing is saying, I'm just going to compare the places that had more pollution versus the places that had less pollution. That's problematic for reasons I've talked about before. The places that had more pollution, they might be more urban. They might be in different parts of the country. They might be different for numerous reasons. Again, you can't be totally sure that you've isolated the causal effect of pollution itself. The idea of this approach is you kind of combine both of those things. You net out whatever other changes might have happened in terms of healthcare or economic activity over this period by comparing the treated areas to the control areas. Okay, so you're gonna say, I saw a bigger change perhaps in the treated areas and outcomes relative to the control areas, and that's gonna give me a more convincing case that it's specifically because of the change in pollution that kids' earnings or employment or whatever changed down the road, okay? So to make that logic a little bit more precise, the key identification assumption that is underlying a difference in difference approach, which you'll talk about this in more detail in section, is what we call parallel trends. So that is, absent the policy reform that actually occurred, we need it to be the case that outcomes would have trended similarly across the two types of areas, across the treatment area and the control area. Now, I'll show you visually what this assumption looks like in a second, but let me just be clear. Like with all of these quasi-experimental designs, this is an assumption that we're making. It does not necessarily need to have to hold. It, it could be that the trends in one set of areas are just different from trends in other areas. But the key point is that if we make this assumption, then this difference in difference estimate is as good as the estimate you would get from a randomized experiment. It would actually isolate the causal effect of the policy change. Now, one way in which you can evaluate the validity of that assumption is by looking at the data before the policy change. So let me again come back to this chart. So first, what is the assumption we're actually making? It is that if we had not had this policy change in 1971, that the trends in these two places in terms of pollution in this uh, particular example uh, would have been parallel to each other. We're just going to assume that that would have been the case. Now, we don't know whether that would have been the case or not, but one way we can assess whether that assumption seems plausible is by looking before the policy change occurred, does it look like those two places were trending similarly to each other, right? It's very intuitive. Does it seem like the black diamonds are a good control or a good counterfactual for the open squares? One way to judge that is to say, do they kind of look like they were moving in the same way? And if you look at this visually, you can see it looks pretty good, right? When there's a dip, for example, in 1969 in the black diamonds, there's also a dip in the open squares. So in other words, the factors that seem to be affecting pollution in one set of counties seem to be similar to the factors that are affecting pollution in the other set of counties. So it seems like a pretty good control group for the places that actually experience the policy change. And that's the type of logic that we use in a difference and difference estimator to isolate the causal effect of the policy change. Okay, so in this case, it looks like the parallel trends assumption is reasonable. And so building off of that, Eisen et al. then examine the economic outcomes at age 30 versus the year in which you're born to isolate the causal effects of pollution on kids' long-term outcomes. And so it's a very simple idea given the setup. They're just gonna plot the difference in outcomes between kids who were born in treated counties, so the counties that were non-attainment were experiencing big declines in pollution, versus the control areas, versus the, by the year in which children were born. And so this is the 
ultimate result of that. This plot shows you differences in employment rates on the left, the number of quarters for which you worked, and then earnings on the right by the year in which you're born in the treated areas relative to the control areas. So they're subtracting the control from the treatment in each year. And you can see that before the policy change, it's basically a flat line. So that's a way of saying there were parallel trends in the two places. They were moving similar to each other. There was no differential trend in employment. And then for kids born right after 1971, in the places where you saw a sharp reduction in pollution, they are significantly more likely to be working 30 years later, and they're earning more money too. Okay, so the bottom line of that is it looks like this effort to reduce pollution by the US government had significant impacts 30 years down the road because exposure to pollution when, when children are born, especially at very young ages, can be very detrimental to health, and then that ends up having downstream consequences. So you can see how in this very nice way, they're able to isolate the magnitude of that effect. And just to summarize what you end up finding there, the reduction in pollution in the non-attainment counties, they conclude, increased children's earnings by about 1%. That implies that this policy change that reduced air pollution in the US increased total earnings by about $6.5 billion per birth cohort of kids. So that's quite a substantial sum. And that even excludes the potential gains that may have accrued to society in other ways, independent of how much these kids were earning. Um, but shows, you know, more generally, like the key upshot of this is that this type of policy change has quite large social benefits, and we're able to take a step towards quantifying what those gains are. So I'll stop there for today, and we'll continue.